story of Darth and Joe Vader. This is when they were about eight and six years old, and they were walking past, they just walked past Jar Jar. They noticed that he w had a couple of apples in his hand and he wasn't eating them, which was unusual. What are you doing? asked Joe. Jar Jar bringing apples to Apple Boy. Apple Boy? Georgie Apple Boy. Jar Jar pay for apples with apples. Get more apples. Okay, Jar Jar. Have fun, said Darth. And they kept walking as they heard the sound of Jar Jar crunching an apple in his mouth. Hmm. Jar Jar's eating the apples that he's going to use to pay for the apples. And Jar Jar yelled back to Darth and Joe, Georgie Boy will lend Jar Jar apples, and then apples will be paid for with apples Jar Georgie Boy, Boy lends Jar Jar. And so... Jar Jar had it all figured out. So he went, they walked past him and they noticed that their sister was there. And she had in her hand two giant brownies. And she started chasing them. Taste my brownies, taste my brownies. We have to get out of here, said Darth. Let's go, said Joe. And they started running. Taste my brownies, taste my brownies. And they saw the pit of death was ahead of them. And they jumped so they wouldn't fall in the pit of death, but the sister fell in. Ah, uh-oh. And quickly, um, Joe used his lightsaber to stop the spikes from crushing her. But, and just as a, a salt vampire was about to catch the sister, she was falling with her hands in front of her, holding two brownies. And they, she fell right on stuffing the brownies into the mouths of two vampires. And they started choking. And they ran away, afraid. Oh, those aren't very scary monsters, said the sister. And Darth and Joe jumped in and said, what are you doing in here? And she said, I'm running away from that thing, one thing. And they, that thing, she pointed behind them and turned around. There was a giant hobgoblin with three heads. They had never seen anything like this. Well, they had seen monsters with three heads before, but not a hobgoblin. And so they, gra they grabbed the bossy sister and they ran and went into a room. Unfortunately, it was full of orange lava which is often the color, color of lava, so they had to, to get out of that room. They went to another door, door into a very short room, and they said, we have to get out of here. And she said, I'm getting you guys in trouble with Mom. What? Well, you aren't supposed to be playing in this pit of death thing. We're not playing, said Dark. We came in here to rescue you. Me, I'm perfectly fine. You saw how those creatures were afraid of me. That's because of your brownies, said Joe. What are you talking about, said the sister. They love the brownies. They went to tell their friends. Mm, okay, sure. Um, well, we have to go. Let's try, wait a minute. This room is getting taller. They noticed the ceiling was getting taller. Yeah, said Darth, but the walls are getting closer, huh? It's getting taller but thinner. And they did notice that the walls were moving in on them. So they had to, as the walls got close, what they did, they grabbed the bossy sister and they started walking with one foot against each of the opposite walls, pushing themselves up that way before the walls had a chance to close all the way. And they got to the very top. There was no ceiling on top and they um, jumped up onto another rock. They were on a ledge, and they saw that there was some light, and there were some vines in the way, and Joe started crawling, but the vines grabbed his arms. They were living vines. They were animal vines. And they started grabbing him, and Darth started using his lightsaber to try to cut off the vines, and when he did, the vines started crying. Ouch! Nobody said there were lightsabers in here, said the vine creature, and it retracted all of its vines. They jumped out, and they said, look, sis, you go home and uh, don't don't get us in trouble with mom. Yeah, said Joe. Uh, we're really looking forward to tasting your next batch of brownies. She said, really? Okay. I'll make some special ones for you. Uh, great. And so she ran off to the house. And meanwhile, Darth, and Joe, Darth, Darth said to Joe, did you notice all the new monsters in there? Yeah, said Joe. I've never seen those ones before. We should go back in and take notes. And so Darth and Joe went back in. The, into the pit of death. They went back into the pit of death and started writing down notes about vine creatures that are afraid of getting cut. About They made a note about bossy sisters' uh, brownies scaring away salt vampires, but they knew that those brownies would scare away about any creature. And they um, three-headed hobgoblins and the room that was short but started getting taller. Unfortunately, it also started getting thinner. And so they wrote about all those things, and then they, they saw a bunch of white smoke ahead of them. And they started walking, and the smoke got thicker and thicker until it sort of sh formed a cloud that was floating, and they could actually feel it. And Darth and Joe crawled on top of the flat, a cloud, 
it was a floating cloud that was dense enough to actually hold them up off the ground. I've never seen anything like this, said Joe. And Darth said, yeah, a cloud like this we could float over the ground. And, and as he said that, the cloud started floating. And then if there was something on the ground like, like uh, green slime, you could float right over it. Yeah, and they looked around, there was no green slime. But they did see um, some guacs, and Darth and Joe waved to them, and, and, the, and Joe said, look, we're flying right over the guacs. And as he said that, they were flying right over the guacs. And Darth said, this would be a great way if you had to f get over one of those, fro like that frozen lake, without sliding around, you could float over it. And as soon as they said that, the cloud quickly turned left, right, left, right, down, up, down, and went around all these curves and went to the frozen lake and floated straight across it. Yeah. He's listening to us, said Joe. This is great, said Darth. How can we get one of these in our pit of death? And when he said that, whoosh, the cloud actually floated up to left to right, swirled around and floated out of the pit of death over to their pit of death and down into it, even though it was closed officially. And Darth and Joe realized that they had found a very valuable thing indeed, a magic floating cloud. This cloud, said, said Joe, I, it has to have come from somewhere. I mean, it has to be an invention. And Darth said, I wonder if this cloud could, can float to where it came from. And as he said that, the cloud floated out of Darth and Joe's pit of death, back into the real pit of death, and past a bunch of monsters and into a portal. And they recognized it because they had been in portals like this before. They lead to other planets, to pits of death and other planets. And it went, they went through the portal and they were, up, they were in Utopian, the mountains of Utopian, which is a planet that Darth and Joe had heard about. And, they, and since they had studied it, they, they recognized that they had, ne had never been there, but they knew that it was actually very close to their own um, Jedi training planet. Utopian was a planet of beautiful mountains and spires, which are like very, very thin, tall mountains that um, Jedis sometimes train uh, by having to climb up these spirals because you have to be an incredible climber and you're not allowed to, of course, transport because they want to make sure that you're physically you're able to do all these Jedi tricks by climbing up cliffs. And it was convenient that they had happened to land on Utopian because it turned out that af that afternoon they were actually scheduled for such a test. And um, they, they knew they had to get back to their, their planet, but now that they had this floating cloud, they thought, hey, this is going to be a great help in our test. And so they um, went, they took the, pl the cloud with them. Um, first they did a little test to see if they could transport with the cloud, and they can. They held up their arms, they held on the cloud, and they transported, they just tra did a test, and they then transported to the Jedi training planet where Obi-Wan Kenobi was ready to give them the clues as to how to do this following test. And he said, I, what I want you to do is go into the cave of understanding not. Understanding not, I, didn't, I, don't, I do not understand, said Joe. Very funny, said Obi-Wan. Now listen, the cave of understanding not, as you may know, is a cave where often we start these Jedi training tests and different things can happen in the cave and we have it set up so that you will be destroyed unless you are very, very, very careful and use the force and always concentrate on what your teachers have taught you. Good luck, boys. But, said Darth, what, what is the goal? What are, what are we trying to do on this test? And Obi-Wan said, you are trying to survive. That sounds like a good, good goal, said Joe. Good luck, boys, said Obi-Wan. And Darth said, you don't think he would actually do anything dangerous to us, said Joe. Nah, I, it, as they were walking in the cave, they, and the cloud was floating next to them. They, um, and Obi-Wan didn't seem to mind that they had a cloud floating next to them. He didn't even ask them about it. They noticed that there was a mysterious face floating in the cave. And Darth and Joe said, and Joe said, please tell us your name. And the 
voice said, I am the name of Guam. Guam, Centaur. I've heard of you. We've studied you in, in Jedi training classes. Guam, um, you're some sort of, of sage, a of wise creature. You can, you're an oracle, aren't you? Say, right, can we see Guam? Yes, said somebody who was standing in the background. Oh, hey, I recognize you. You're Potato Pumpkin Head. And it's true, the person who said that had a large potato pumpkin for a head, which is sort of a potato on one side and a pumpkin on the other side. And Darth said, no, 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 his name is Dirty Sock Nose. And sure enough, he had Dirty Sock for a nose. Please stop doing that to me, said um, Sneaker Face. And he walked away. Unfortunately, because he had a sneaker for a face, he walked right into a wall, banged his head and fell unconscious. So Darth and Joe said, Guam, uh, we're on a test. And, he, and Guam said, yes, I know. Your test is to survive. First, you must not be eaten by the giant saber-toothed tiger that is quickly approaching you. And they looked and yelled, ah, as they ran because it was a giant saber-toothed tiger. And, and jump on the cloud. And they jumped on the cloud. Float away. And the cloud started floating very fast. And it floated, floated over a, a pool of oil that the saber-toothed tiger couldn't cross. And, and they saw a way out of the cave straight up. Straight up. And they floated straight up out of the cave through a very, very tall hole way up high. And, and suddenly, they realized that they were on Utopia. How did we get here? And, and then they looked back be, below them and they saw that there was a small electrical storm in the air and they realized that the Jedis had set up a space transporter zone outside that hole. And um, there were, they were surrounded, since they were surrounded by about 17 T-Rexes, they decided to be scared. And so um, Darth said, Joe said, what's the plan? And Darth said, well, let's start by being scared. And um, and then they, they also said, let's float up the clouds. I mean, let's float, float up uh, to uh, see the, that spire. That'll get away, because obviously the dinosaurs couldn't climb the spires. And there was a sign saying, no clouds allowed, signed Obi-Wan Kenobi. Oh. And so they said, cloud, just stay above the, the dinosaurs' heads. We'll be right back. And they started climbing up the spire, which is a very pointy thin mountain. They climbed using pickaxes in their, in their belts and they were, it's very, they were flipping up using their climbing techniques and finally because they were the best Jedi's really in the universe they got in training, they got to the very top of the spire and they held on and we made it, had we passed the test and just then the huge bolt of lightning that came down and struck the spire right next to them told them that maybe not and when it struck they both instinctively let go started falling, and Darth said, Cloud, catch me, Fruit said, catch Joe, Fruit, and it caught Joe. Luckily for them, they had clouds with them. And when they floated down to the ground, the um, T-Rexes the had been turned off. They started moving, and there was Obi-Wan Kenobi, and, and he said, you boys have survived. I guess that means you passed today's test. Oh, thank goodness. Those tests are hard when you don't know what you're supposed to do, said Joe. Well, you're supposed to survive, and you have. But, said Joe, Darth, that means that if we hadn't survived, we wouldn't have passed the test. That is correct, said Obi-Wan Kenobi. But that would mean we'd, wouldn't that mean we'd be dead? And he said, technically speaking, yes. But, but that's not a very fun test. And Obi-Wan said, you are training to become Jedi warriors. This is one of your last tests. It's a very, very important test because all Jedi warriors must be alive. Dead ones don't fight very well at all. They just lie there, don't do much. And Darth and Joe thanked him for his wisdom. And they got on their cloud and they transported home. The end. Once upon a time, Lord, Darth and Joe Vader were out taking a walk with their brother, sister, I, no, they don't have a brother-sister, but they do have a brother, a little brother named Sam, who is just starting to walk, and um, Sam was holding their new baby sister, 
whose name was Robin. Darth, Joe, Sam, and Robin Vader were all going on a nice walk and they brought along some food because they decided to have a picnic when they got to Picnic Rock. So, were they at Picnic Rock yet? No, they were not because first they had to go through the red and yellow woods. There's uh, some woods on the other side of the, to the, just to the right of the desert near Darth and Joe's house. And these woods happen to contain the most beautiful red and yellow trees that um, just about anybody on the planet has ever seen. It's like it's always fall there. The leaves are always red and yellow. And so Darth and Joe and Sam and, uh, and Robin were um, walking through the red and yellow woods when a sparrow, or a bird very similar to a sparrow on their planet, landed on Joe's shoulder and said something like, <laughs> and he also said, <laughs> and a little bit more, he said, all he also said, <laughs> and Joe was surprised to hear, <laughs> because it meant that it wasn't a sparrow at all. The sparrow was saying that he had taken the form of a sparrow, but actually the sparrow was a, uh, a, a, a beaverovsky. Beaverovskis are, as you might know, um, creatures who look like giant beavers. They have huge flat tails, and they can, that's their main weapon for defense. They slap the ground and it shakes the ground so everybody falls over. Unfortunately, the beaverovskis fall over too, so it doesn't really work that well. And so, Darth and Joe and Sam and Laura were listening to this sparrow, which was really a Beaverovsky, which had transformed itself into the shape of a sparrow. But how did it do that? We'll find out later, perhaps. And they, um, and the sparrow was saying that their people, the Beaverovskys, were under attack, and they had set, they had managed, they had a machine that could um, change your shape to another shape. So they had managed to change one of them, that particular one, into the shape of a sparrow so that it could fly away and not be detected by the enemy because any Beaverovsky that tried to escape would instantly be captured by the um, creatures who were attacking the planet on which the Beaverovskys lived. And so Darth and Joe were very alarmed to hear this and as Jedi warriors they knew that they had to go to the aid of the Beaverovskys. They had to find out what was going on. But the Sparrow, they, they said, so Joe said, <coughs> which meant, we'll help you as soon as we drop off Sam and Robin. But, Dar but um, the Sparrow said, <coughs> which meant, there's no time. <coughs> we have to go right away. And so Darth and Joe decided to take Sam and Robin with them. They knew it was somewhat dangerous, but they thought they could probably find a safe place for Sam and Robin. Maybe they could turn them into sparrows when they got there so that the creatures attacking the Beaverovsky would not harm them. So Darth and Joe Vader took Sam and Laura and followed the Sparrow, which um, got onto a... The Sparrow, unfortunately, um, got into a spaceship that was much too small for Darth and Joe or Sam and Laura to fit into. It was about as big as my shoe. Um, but it was made specifically for a Sparrow-sized creature to fly. And so Darth and Joe said, well, we can't follow you. We don't have our spaceship here. Could you hold on? We can transport back and get it. And the Sparrow said, which means, of course, there's no time. I will shrink you down to my size. And with that, the Sparrow took out from the spaceship. Obviously, the Sparrow and Beaverovsky creature knew that Darth and Joe were there, and that's why it came to Darth and Joe's planet to get help. And it took out from the spaceship four little green pills and um, picked them up with its beak and dropped them into each one of their mouths. No sooner had the pills dissolved in, on their tongues then Darth, Joe, Sam, and Laura were very small indeed. In fact, they were just a little bit smaller than the Sparrow. So the Sparrow had started off uh, bigger than them in the form of a Beaverovsky, which is a large creature, uh, compared to Darth and Joe. So it looks like Darth and Joe and Laura and Sam were able to fit onto the spaceship with the Sparrow. And indeed, that is just what happened. The sparrow flew the ship. So it made a sparrow kind of science fiction noise when it flew. And it flew. And it flew. And it flew. Dodging meteors and 
later on when they got out of the atmosphere dodging um, flying ice cream cones and anything else that might have been floating around in space. And it was a very small spaceship and it had to be careful not to get broken if it hit any hard, sharp objects. It flew all the way to the Beaverovsky's planet which was 1.3 light years away. Luckily, it flew through a wormhole in space, which allowed it to make the journey in only 1.3 minutes, which it's, it's at the ratio of one minute per light year. So, they, they landed on the planet, and the crotons immediately turned to them. The crotons are large, metallic creatures, as tall as a house, made out of metal, and very, very mean and they were busy fighting the Beaverovskis. They saw a spaceship land, they turned, but then they, when they saw that only five little creatures came out of it, they weren't interested. And so the sparrow said, <coughs> which means follow me, and they did. They followed the s sparrow to the secret headquarters of the Beaverovsky on that planet, Zingbar, which is the name of the planet. Sometimes planets are named after the creatures live there, you know, or the creatures are named after the planet, like planet Vulcan, where the Vulcans live. The Klingons come from Klingon, the Martians come from Mars, and the humans come from planet human, I think. But, uh, but this planet uh, had a different name than the creatures, the Beaverovskis. And, but the point is that they got to the headquarters of the Beaverovskis, and the sparrow walked into a machine, and some Beaverovskis flipped some switch, switches, and the sparrow turned back into a Beaverovsky. Darth and Joe said, can you increase our size so we can talk to you easily, more easily? And the Beaverovsky said, what? I can't hear you. You're too small wait, I'll increase your size, then I'll be able to hear you. And so, um, it aimed a, um, a green beam at them and asked them to swallow a small drop of blue liquid, which they did, and the combination of the liquid and the beam increased them back to their normal size. And, um, and the beaver obviously said, what, now what, what were you saying? And Dart said, we were asking you to make us larger so we could talk to you. And Beaverovsky says, I'm sorry, we can only make you as large as you were originally. And Joe said, no, we meant before. And he says, yes, exactly, before. Oh, never mind, said Sam, who was following the conversation with great interest and still holding Robin in his arms. And so, the, um, so Joe turned to Sam and said, now you, you have to take care of Laura. I mean, uh, not that that's her name, because her name is Robin. What? Why did you call her Laura? It, I, I forget the name of our sister every once in a while, said Joe, but you have to take care of her or whoever it is, so you can't come with us on this adventure, you have to stay here. And Sam said, I'm coming on the adventure. The Beaverovsky can take care of Robin. And the Beaverovsky said, oh yes, we love taking care of small humans. Well, it'll be no problem at all. And so one of the Beaverovskys reached down and picked up Robin, who was still a baby, in diapers, and held her in um, her, his arms. And in fact, said, look, we can play a little game. And he put uh, Robin on his tail, and he, they took turns flipping Robin back and forth, playing catch with her, and she loved it because she got to f fly back and forth between the tails of the Beaverovsky. Floop, floop. They had kind of soft tails, so it didn't hurt when she landed. Floop, and she flew through the air. And pretty soon Sam wanted to do that too, and he started doing that. And then Joe said, I want to do it. And then Dart said, we don't have time, we have to go. And then Sam got off the tail, and they kept flipping Laura, uh, Robin back and forth. But Sam... Joe and Darth um, went into another room with the Beaverovsky who had previously been a sparrow and they asked what they can do to help and the Beaverovsky whose name was June said well it's like this Sam and Joe and and uh, Darth these crotons um, are attacking our planet why are they attacking your planet said Darth oh, we don't know they just hate us they attack they hate they hate our way of, of Beaverovsky life they just hate Beaverovskis. They just attack us for no reason at all. Hmm, said Joe. That doesn't seem very likely, but uh, let, let's skip that point for right now and uh, ask you, where are they coming from? They're coming from their planet, of course. Aha. Uh -huh. And are they still coming? Yes, yes, more of them all the time. And where are they landing? In the Great Valley. Ah, so that's where they're coming from, said Joe. And Dar said, hmm. And Sam said, hmm, also. And the Beaverovsky said, June said, you have to help us stop them. We must destroy them before they destroy us. Okay, well, uh, we're going to help solve this problem. Oh, thank you. We knew we could trust Darth and Joe Vader and his young brother, Sam. And Joe said, no, Sam, you're not trained to be a Jedi warrior yet. They knew Sam wanted to become a Jedi warrior. 
So you can follow, but you have to be very careful. Just do what we tell you to do. And Sam said, don't worry. I'll, I'll do what you tell me to do, and we'll beat these croton creatures. And um, so that's, that's what happened. They decided first to go to the source of the problem, the Great Valley, to see the crotons for themselves. So when Darth and Joe and Sam got there, they saw that sure enough, spaceship after spaceship was landing, out coming the metallic giant crotons, and they were getting orders from some larger metallic croton who was pointing and speaking in some language they didn't instantly recognize uh, because it was a mechanical language and not a language of an animal or a small child. And um, the crotons were going off to destroy the Beaverovskis. This just didn't seem right. This just doesn't seem right, said Joe. The Beaverovskis living here in peace and these creatures and robots coming down and destroying them. We have to do something about this. You're right, said Darth, but there are an awful lot of them. How about a time lasso, said Joe. Yeah, but we don't have enough time lassos to lasso all of them. We have to find something else. What about a magnet, said um, Sam. Hey, that's an idea. Maybe these guys are metallic. Let's test. And um, Joe had a refrigerator magnet in his pocket, and he flipped it in the air, and it hit one of the, of the crotons, but it fell right off. They must be made out of stainless steel or some other non-magnetized metal, said Darth. Right, said Joe. Good idea, said Sam, but it's not going to work on these particular robot creatures. Well, we have to think of something else, they, uh, they agreed. Ah, I have an idea, said Darth. We've got to get to know them better so we can find their weakness, or at least find out what, why they're attacking the Beaverovskis. Good thinking. Um, we could just ask them, no, nah, why would they trust us? We have to get them on our side. I have an idea, come on. And they went back to the Beaverovsky headquarters, and they decided to change one of them into a beaver. And Joe said, a beaverovsky, to, to, to trick the croton. So, so um, Joe said, you change me into a beaverovsky. And, um, and, then, and then you and Sam can be pretending to beat me up. Good idea. And then Sam said, no, 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 change me. Because I don't know how to do any Jedi warrior fighting yet. But if you change me into beaverovsky, then you two can flip me back and forth, and then if you need to fight the Crotons, you'll both be in your human-type form, and you'll be able to fight them easier than if you were Beaverovsky. He does make a lot of sense, said jo Darth. Yeah, said Joe. It could be dangerous. I don't care, said Sam. Danger is my middle name. It is? I never knew that. Mom named you Sam Danger Vader? Yeah, well, she hasn't known that yet, but I just had my middle name changed to Danger. Okay. Let's go. So they asked the Beaverovskis, the Beaverovskis agreed. There can never be too many Beaverovskis after all, and they, so they were kind of flattered by the idea that somebody would like to turn into one physically. So they put Sam into the machine, and they transformed him into the shape of a Beaverovsky. And he went along with them, with Darth and Joe, back to the Crotons. The Crotons, the Beaverovskis asked if Darth and Joe if they wanted any other Beaverovskis to come with them to help them fight, and Darth and Joe said, no, we can do this on our own. It'd be safer if you stayed here. They said, all right, we trust you guys. And so they, Darth and Joe and um, Sam the Beaverovsky looking guy went back to the Great Valley, right up to the spaceship where the Crotons were coming out. And, um, um, Dar and, and Joe um, started poking the big cro leader Croton on the shoulders. And then before he had a chance to turn around, they, started f they grabbed Sam by the beaver tail and started um, flipping him back and forth like they were... Like, like he was made out of a tennis racket and um, bumping him on the ground. And the Croton said, yes, yes, C uh, and can we help you? And Darth and Joe said, no, we've got this one taken care of. Bloop, 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 bloop. Look, we've destroyed it. And Sam pretended to be unconscious and stuck out his tongue. Thank you. You are truly our friends and we don't even know you. Oh, I'm Darth and this is Joe Vader. The Jedi Warriors, we have heard of you. Oh, you have. Why have you come to help us? We didn't even ask for your help. Well, we, we know about these, these Beaverovskis have been giving you some problems. So we just wanted to see what was going on. And so the Croton, which now trusted Darth and Joe completely, said, well, as he directed more um, Beaverovskis away, uh, more Crotons away to fight the Beaverovskis, well, we have to destroy these Beaverovskis before they destroy us. Aha, said Darth. Aha, said Joe. And exactly how are they destroying you here on their own planet? Well, their planet 
Uh, um, I don't know if you've been paying attention to the newspapers, but their planet recently changed courses. It changed its orbit. And in its new orbit, it's um, pushing, the gravity of the planet has been um, pushing all, of the, get, sucking these asteroids out of their normal orbits and sending them right to our planet. It's been smashing down and killing our people, our buildings and our, our peanut butter sandwiches and not that we eat them, but they're, they're a form of artwork for our people. And everything that we hold dear and love. And the Beaverovskis purposely have been trying to destroy us. And the only thing we can do is come here and destroy the Beaverovskis so that we can get their planet. And then maybe um, so they, that they won't stop us from destroying their planet and, and we'll be safe again. Darling Joe said, I see. I see. So the Beaverovskis, you know, I think I know, I know a way of um, fixing this problem, said Darth. Yeah, said Joe, and I bet I know that way too. What is it, said Croton? Well, you're using brute force on the Beaverovskis, but I'm not sure they really understand what's going on. Oh, said Croton, the Beaverovskis are evil incarnate. That means they're just purely bad. All they want to do is, they just live to destroy Crotons. That's all they've ever wanted to do. They've never come over and asked us to borrow any sugar. They've never come over and asked us if, if uh, you know, if, if they could learn to sing our songs or to walk our walks. They've never worn any I love Crotons hats, hats on their heads. And they said, by the way, the, the um, Crotons, this lead Croton was speaking Zarbic, which is a one of the universal languages that in the galaxies that, um, that people have been trying to get a lot of other creatures to learn so that different creatures could communicate with one another if, if they weren't Googs and didn't know everybody's language. So, uh, all the languages of all the um, animals. So that's why uh, Darth and Joe could understand the croton. That is just a little aside a bit of information for you there to file away in your memory compartments. Now, in any case, Darth and Joe and the uh, fake unconscious Sam Beaverovsky were listening to the croton speak, and Darth and Joe said, We think we can get the crotons to change course, but it's going to take... Um, we're going to need one of you to come with us. It'll be very brave. It's a dangerous mission. You might be destroyed. And the lead Croton said, I am not afraid of being destroyed if it means destroying the Beaverovsky's evil mission. And so he went with Darth and Joe, and they dragged the unconscious Sam by the tail and, um, and put him, still with his tongue sticking out, in a room um, when they got to the Beaverovsky's headquarters. And they said, we're going to have to pretend that we've captured you, so let us wrap you with this rope. And they wrapped up the Croton's arms with rope behind his back. And they went in and they said, we have captured the lead Croton. And the Croton looked at him and they said, don't worry, we have a plan. Oh, great! Uh, finally a breakthrough in the war, said the other Crotons, said the other Beaverovskis. We need to speak with, um, with June and the other lead um, Beaverovskis, because we have a plan. And so they did. They got June together and the other lead Beaverovskis, there were seven all together, and they got the croton and they said, first of all, we need a, a room with some pizza in it. Pizza, pizza, a room with pizza. Beaverovskis can prepare that. And so they prepared a room with a table and some chairs and some pizza, and Darth and Joe brought the lead croton into the room and br also um, brought June into the room because they could see that June actually was one of the lead Beaverovskis and um, said, the other lead Beaverovskis wait out here. We'll bring the prisoner inside the room. And they had him sit down, and they untied him and said, don't worry, we have him under control. We have a special gun that control him. controls him, said Joe to the Beaverovsky, because he was afraid of the croton when he had his arms released. And he said, before we do anything, I'm hungry, let's have some pizza. How can you eat at a time like this, said June? We have the lead Beaverov, the lead croton here. We have to destroy him or get information from him. Yeah, but let's eat first. Everybody gives out information better when they're when they're they're on a full stomach. Otherwise, it's just going to be all cranky. All right. And so, the Beaverovsky, June, and the Croton, whose name was Malar, Malar and June and Darth and Joe started eating their pizza. And actually, Sam smelled the pizza through the door, and he couldn't stop himself. And he ran into the room. He ran out of the room where he was. Ran into the room and and said, "Pizza, can I have some?" And Croton said, I thought I, they destroyed you, because he recognized that Beaverovsky. Oh, yeah, well, I'm, um, I'm not completely destroyed. I'm good enough to eat pizza. What's going on here, said Croton. And, and um, sa said Malar the Croton. And, and June said, well, you're our prisoner. That's what's going on. And we're going to get some vital information from you so we can 
finally stop your cruel invasion and save the, the Beaverovsky people. And Mallory said, ha, save them so they can destroy us? What are you talking about? We're innocent, peace-loving people. You're the ones who are trying to destroy us. And so Darth said, wait, wait, wait. Let's not talk about any of this right now. Let's just have some pizza. And so they started eating pizza. And actually, it was good pizza. And it was a sort of pizza that Beaverovskys and um, Crotons and Darth and Joes, uh, whatever creatures they were, I think, very similar to humans, could eat in peace and uh, hunger and enjoy it because um, it was actually one of the best pizzas that all three of them, all three types of those creatures had had. And for, certainly the first time that Crotons and Beaverovskys of any kind have ever sat down and eaten together. And Darth said, now June, um, tell us a little bit about your family. My, my fa well, um, I come from a large Beaverovsky family. I have um, 16 children of my own, and I'm one of 23 children, but we're thinking of having more children. And Croton said, oh, I have 23 children myself. What? Said, said June, Crotons don't have children. They just manufacture them in a factory. Oh, no, said Croton. We make our own children. You do? How do you make them? Oh, it's a fascinating process. It, what, what we do is a bunch of us get together, and we take com um, some components from our own bodies out and we construct little crotons who then are able to um, increase their own mass or their own size by, work by finding some scrap metal and building on. So, and then um, we go and we replace the missing parts on ourselves. So it's a cooperative effort. It takes about five or six crotons to create one croton offspring. How many Beaverovskis does it take? And the Beaverovsky says, oh, it's just me and, and my mate we, uh, we create the, uh, our offspring, our, our babies ourselves, but then we live in a community um, and there are several adult Beaverovskis who care for all the children because otherwise we, we make so many children uh, they wouldn't be able to care for them. And the Croton said, well, that's fascinating. How come your, po your planet isn't overpopulated if you're creating so many Beaverovskis? Um, I mean, if every two Beaverovskis create 20, 16 to 23 babies, Beaverovskis. And the Beaverovsky said, well, we've been spreading out to other planets um, where, where we can live, and also um, we've been working on a program of miniaturization. We're already able to, tra to um, change our sizes, and we're thinking if we miniaturize ourselves, we'll have a lot more room on this planet. Fascinating, said the Croton. We've been having the exact same problem, but we decided that we, didn't know how, we couldn't figure out how to miniaturize our components and still have us work correctly. And the Beaverovsky said, oh, well, we have a, we've dev devised a molecular miniaturization. It, it, hey, we, these guys use it, Darth and Joe and the brother Sam. Yeah, said Sam. What? Your brother is a Beaverovsky? Oh, we, he's not really a Beaverovsky. He just was trans, he, we um, transformed him to that shape, said, said, said June. We'd like to see how it works. And the Croton said, yeah, this is fascinating. And so they all walked out into their room, and the other Beaverovskis were surprised to see the Croton walking among them, not tied up. And Darth just said, said to them, it's okay, it's okay. Yeah, June said, yeah, he, he's a cool Croton, don't worry about it. And they showed him the machine and said, look, I can turn myself into a sparrow. And he showed him, turned himself into a sparrow and then back into a Beaverovsky. Wow, would that work on creatures like Beaverovskis? Well, it might, and jo but Darth was quick to point out, you might have to change some of the settings because Beaverovskis are made out of metal, because Crotons are made out of metal. Huh, I almost said Beaverovskis, and they all laughed. Let's go back in and finish our pizza. You know what I would really love, said the Croton? Ice cream. Hey, you like ice cream too? I didn't think that Crotons ate ice cream, said the Beaverovsky June uh, to Malar, and so they, the Beaver, June said, ice cream for everybody. And so they brought in some ice cream, and the Crotons and the, the Beaverovskis on the other side of the door also ate the ice cream while they ate ice cream on the inside. And pretty soon they had a pretty good time talking, and then they said, well, what were we talking about again? You know, I'd like to see your family sometime. So they were getting along pretty well. But then again, you guys are trying to kill us. And the and Croton said, Malar said, listen, we don't we don't trying to kill you. We're just trying to stop you. That killing you is the only way. Stop it from what? From destroying the Crotons, said Malar. Destroying the Crotons? Yes, yes, yes. When you moved your planet out of orbit, it um. It, it caught, it, you're sending down all those meteors to destroy us. Oh, said, said, said um, June. Well, we didn't purposely move our planet out of order, out of orbit. There was an explosion. One of our experiments went wrong and then a huge factory blew up when we were trying to create this miniaturization and transformation process. Oh, you mean a giant explosion pushed your planet off orbit? Yeah. 
and it's terrible because it's really cold out here in this larger um, circular elliptical or that is orbit and we haven't been able to figure out a way of getting us back because we thought we would set off another explosion but then we we're afraid that our planet couldn't take it and the planet might fall apart and the croton said but you can move planets it's just a matter of, of adjusting the uh, magnetic poles of the planets and doing a little vibration what yeah we move planets all the time said croton said malar the croton well said Said, said June, it, if you could help us move this planet, it would solve both our problems. Exactly. And the Croton um, turned on his wristwatch communicator and he said, Attention all Crotons, this is Malar. Go back in your spaceships. Call off the invasion. We have reached a settlement with the Beaverovskis. Repeat, stop attacking Beaverovskis. We have reached a solution. And um, pretty soon there was a call in to the Beaverovskis. And it said, it was from some of the people outside, uh, some of the Kree Bivrovskis to June and to the other leaders saying, the, the Crotons have retreated, they stopped attacking us. Should we attack them in their spaceship? And June said, no, no, no. And the other leaders said, no, do not attack any Crotons. Come back to the compound. We are safe from the attack. The attack is, the Croton attack has been called off. But they're going to attack us again, said the person outside. No, 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 we've reached a solution. Repeat, do not attack the Crotons. And so... Darth and Joe helped set up a television station that went back and forth between the Croton planet and the Bivarovsky's planet so they could communicate all the time in case there was any problem. And the Crotons um, used their technical expertise to adjust the magnetic pole and gently vibrate, um, cautiously vibrate the Bivarovsky's planet which um, had its own name, which I'm not going to reveal because it's early on the tape, and they vibrated and, and changed the magnetic field until the Beaverovsky planet was back into orbit and stopped the meteors from flying down toward the um, Croton's planet. And so the Crotons and the Beaverovskis realized it was all a mistake and, they, and that the other side wasn't just trying to kill them for no reason. But they realized they also learned a valuable lesson that you have to ask why somebody's mad at you. You can't just assume that you know why they're mad at you because you're probably wrong. So, because there's usually a reason and sometimes there's a reason for the reason. So there are always, there are sometimes there are layers of reason that, that um, go, that explain why this conflict is happening. That, that it's not just happening for no reason at all. So they were able to find their solution and live in peace and the Beaverovskis and the Crotons uh, actually became a friendly, friendly peoples living together to solve all sorts of problems in the galaxy. And Darth and Joe and Sam and even Robin, their names became famous once again for helping to solve problems. And Sam wanted to stay in the shape of a Beaverovsky, but Darth and Joe convinced him that his mom wouldn't be very happy about that. And uh, Robin had a great time playing with the Beaverovskis and they were looking around for her and she was on, the, on Malar, the Croton's shoulders, and he was giving her rides but then it was time to go, and so Malar kissed her, which is the first time that a metallic um, a croton had ever kissed a human-type creature, and they we all waved goodbye, and they, um, they asked if they needed to be um, flown back to their planet, but Darth and Joe said they could transport, which is true, and Darth and Joe hugged Sam and Robin, so they were all very close together, so they could use their rings of transportation, which actually were contained in their wristwatches now, and transport back to their own planet. The just in time for dinner, by the way. And although they weren't hungry, uh, their mom was had pizza, and they said, "Oh, pizza!" But this pizza was different because it had broccoli in it, which actually is they consider to be quite a delicacy on their planet. So they had it anyway, and they were very full and decided to go to bed early that night. The end. By the way, after Darth and Joe got home that night, they had an idea, which was to write down the stuff that had happened between the Beaverovskis and the Crotons and turn it into a training manual. So it was like a booklet where they wrote down the steps that people can use to solve the problems of planets that might happen to be at war. Because, you know, usually, when planets are at war, they just call it, they, the other planet thinks that the other people are terrorists and they think that they're terrorists and that they're just attacking each other for no reason because they don't bother to find out what's really going on. So Darth and Joe made this manual to help 
other creatures solve problems in the galaxy, and, and uh, perhaps even in other galaxies, if, if, if they can distribute the manual uh, widely enough. And it, they came up with their six steps for solving problems. And this first step is information gathering, where they try to find out what's really going on, because you might think you know what the problem is about, but you're, a lot of times you're wrong. You think you know what people are arguing about, or what you're mad about, or what somebody's mad at you about. But really, you have to ask a lot of questions because it could be something else that's going on. So first, you have to gather all the information about it as you can, which they did when they went and spoke with the Crotons. Then, they um, decided that the second step after information gathering is education. You have to explain it to people. So they had to go back and explain the situation to the Crotons, make sure that the Crotons and the uh, Beaverovskis knew what was really going on. So they had to educate themselves about it, and they had to educate the other the people who were having the fight. The next step was they had to prepare themselves. They knew that it, it was a dangerous mission going to see the Crotons or the Beaverovskis, and they had to um, get ready for the possibility that there was it was c could be difficult. The step after that was negotiation, where they got the Beaverovskis and the Crotons to speak, to talk to each other, and negotiate to figure out how they could solve their problem. So they used negotiations um, and they were prepared to to use other methods they were prepared to do anything to stop the fight from happening that would have been direct action when you actually get in the way and stop the Beaverovskis and the Crotons from smashing each other until they will listen to you and go back to negotiations and the final step which they did is called reconciliation where they that's where they got the be because they solved their problem I've been listening in on this Darth and Joe story, and it seems to me that it's continued on the other side.